good to see everybody. Fantastic time in the fall when everybody's headed back to school. I hear all the conversation about computers, and uh, I guess it's Angela's got a nice display out there. So uh, it's an exciting time. I remember it when we were little. It, I know it brought a lot of joy to my mother. She stood at the front door just waving. <laughs> Of course, that, that all fell apart at 3.30 when we got back home. Uh, back to school Sunday is August the 4th, and then our pantry is the middle of the month around the 15th. and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide we may so, mass, so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
act of praise, and we'll read it responsively. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They, they are, are corrupt. corrupt. They, they do, do not have deeds. deeds. There, there is, is none, none that do good. good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all people to see if there are any that are wise who seek after God. They have they all gone astray. They, they are all alike, alike perverse. There is none that does good, no, not one. Have they no knowledge, the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores their fortunes, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Amen. to a time when we share the, our celebrations and our prayer concerns. So if you have something, let's start with celebrations. If you have something you'd like to rejoice about together this morning. Great to have you all back with us. And I, I understand you had a really fun trip. I'm glad that you were safe and had a good time. And it's great to have you back. Praise God. Praise God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. <laughs> Moving on to prayer concerns. What would you all like to pray together about this morning? We pray for Mike, who's been hospitalized with some blood clots in his lungs. We pray for God to give healing and to, um, to be with him in the hospital, to be with the doctors and nurses and other medical professionals who are caring for him to bring healing. And we pray for his sister, who has asked for us to offer these prayers this morning. We pray for God to give her comfort and peace as she worries about her brother. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Jerry, who is uh, in a battle against bladder cancer and is um, in the middle of treatment and having all of the, uh, the, the adjustment issues and the side effects that come along with that. So we pray for Jerry. We pray for the treatment to be successful, for his cancer to be uh, eradicated, and we pray for God to give him relief from these side effect symptoms and to help him to adjust and tolerate the treatment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Rick, who has received a diagnosis of eye cancer, cancer in one of his eyes. 
We pray for the Lord to bring healing to the situation, to give those who are treating him uh, wisdom, to understand the best course forward, to, to treat the cancer and hopefully uh, save his vision. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Terry, who is, who is uh, beginning or continuing with his treatment, we pray for Terry, we pray for God to uh, continue to strengthen him and Jamie and to bring complete healing uh, in his body. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Micah, whose mother has passed away uh, suddenly and unexpectedly just last night. We commend her mother to God's loving care and mercy and pray that Micah and her family would be comforted with the peace of the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of this incredible turmoil and in the midst of this pain and this grief, we pray for God's presence to be with the family. We especially pray for Micah who also suffers with anxiety and we pray for God to ease her fears and to bring her peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for Larry who has been diagnosed with multiple myeloma and been given only a six month prognosis. And so we pray for Larry. We pray that if it be God's will that there would be healing in this situation, that his life would be extended. We pray that God would be with Larry as he's currently hospitalized to bring him comfort, to bring him peace, even in the situation that is so devastating. We pray for Larry's family, that God would give them peace. We pray that the Lord's Holy Spirit would, even in the midst of this incredibly dark and painful journey, be especially present and give them the strength that they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for Carol and Shirley, who are in a, a nursing home, a assisted living facility. They're not doing well, and um, we pray for this couple, that God would give them comfort and strength, that God would bring healing to their bodies, that God would give them peace and ease any anxiety, worry, or fear they may be experiencing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Julia and for all the educators who are returning to the schools uh, this week. We pray for God to be with the teachers and the staff and the students to keep them safe and to uh, increase their knowledge and their wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Michael who was involved in a riding lawnmower accident and very severely injured his arm. He's had to have surgery to repair the damage. We pray for a swift recovery for that he would have a regain full use of his arm and that he would experience complete healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for Kathy's sister, Jenny, and her son, Pete, we pray for God to be with them and to meet their needs, whatever they may be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Randy, for God to give him healing, to lift him up, to continue to strengthen him. Uh, we pray for God to, uh, uh, to move in this process that he's in the middle of as he waits for a uh, transplant. And we just pray for God to, to work God's will in the midst of that and to bring healing and to bring a renewal of strength for Randy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Curtis and Dee, we pray for safe travels as they uh, go to visit Camille. So we pray you have a wonderful visit with her and that you'll be safely uh, brought back home to us. Lord, in your mercy hear our prayer. Yeah, we continue to see incredible unrest and, and devastation in, uh, as this war continues in Israel. We pray for God to move uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring peace. We know that God's desire for the world is peace, not war. And so we pray for God's shalom, for God's peace to rule in the hearts of humankind. Uh, we pray for Israel. We pray for Ukraine. We pray for, I think I read about some places in Africa that some war has broken out. I just saw another thing about Sudan and the famine that's happening as a result of conflict there. There is war and violence everywhere, it seems, these days. And so we pray for God's peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you have heard the prayers of your people gathered here in your name. You have promised to hear the prayers of those who trust in you. You know our thoughts, you know our hearts, you know our desires, and you know our needs. You know us better than we know ourselves. And so we lift our prayers in confidence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. Are you excited to go back to school? Yeah, Suzanne is. Freddie is making, he's no comment. He's saying no comment. It's direct all inquiries to my press secretary. <laughs> or my attorney. <laughs> Maybe his attorney, right, Amy? <laughs> I want to talk to you all for just a minute this morning about a story that we're going to hear just a little bit later on in the service. In just a few minutes, we're going to hear the story of Jesus feeding a multitude of people, like 5,000 people, using nothing but a few loaves of bread and a couple of pieces of fish. And do you know where Jesus got the loaves and the fish that he used to feed those 5,000 people? From a young child, from a young kid. There is, in the story, 5,000 people, remember, are here. 5,000 people. And in this story, there is only one person who thought to bring a lunch with him, and it was this little boy. And when Jesus says to his disciples, we need to feed these people, the disciples say, we don't have any food. They forgot to bring food. Nobody else had any food. And then this little boy says, I've got a little bit of food. I brought a lunch. Jesus, you can have my lunch. And Jesus takes that little bit of food and he uses that little bit of food, just enough for one little boy, to feed 5,000 people. That's really something, isn't it? And here's what we can learn from that story. Sometimes we might think that we ourselves are too little or too young, don't have anything that we can really do for Jesus, for the church. We feel like we're just kind of, you know, we don't have anything to give. But what Jesus teaches us in this story this morning is that no matter how little we might think we have, when we ask Jesus to bless it and to use it, Jesus can do amazing things. So even when we feel like we're very small, like we don't have very much to give, if we ever feel like we're just not very important, remember that Jesus can do all sorts of amazing things that we can't even imagine. And all we have to do is ask Jesus to bless whatever it is we have to give, even if we don't think it's very much. Even if we don't think that we have much to offer Jesus, I can tell you that Jesus can take it and use it and do things with it that we would never imagine. I'll bet you that little boy didn't think his lunch was going to feed a whole crowd of folk. I bet he didn't think that when he got up that morning and packed his fish. But look what Jesus did with it. And that is really, really something. And we can remember that Jesus is always ready to do more than we could ever imagine. And all we have to do is offer Jesus what we have. And Jesus will do everything else. That's, you know what I'm going to say, that's good news. <laughs> that's good news. And you're good news. And you're good news. And you're good news. And you're good news. They've started crawling, by the way, so it is endlessly entertaining up here for me. <laughs> if I ever seem like I'm getting distracted in the middle of my sentences, it's because the cuteness has just overwhelmed me. <laughs> okay, can I pray for you kids? Heavenly Father, pour out your blessing upon these children. Bless them in the coming days, especially those who are returning to school. Pour out your blessing upon them as they return to their classes. Bless them, Lord, in their play, in their daily lives. Give them, a, even the youngest ones, give them a sense of your presence so they might know that you are with them, that you love them, and that you care for them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Thanks, kids. Good hanging out with you. Boom. Good luck at school.
scripture it comes uh, first comes from Ephesians 6 verses 14 through 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask, or imagine, according to his power, that, that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And then we look at John 6, verses 1 through 21. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed the far side of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of uh, Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to, to have a bite. And another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place, and the men sat down, and about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they, all, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign and Jesus did, that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into the boat, set off across the lake to Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. This is the word for, of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before I get all the way into the sermon today, I just want to look at the end of that passage. Um, Jesus walking on the water. They got Jesus in the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. Michael, this is for you. Do you think that that was teleportation. Did they get beamed? Yes, it was. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you think it was Scotty? Okay. Well, we won't we won't get into the theological implications of that right now. But uh, <laughs> oh, goodness gracious! That's called easing into the sermon, y'all. That's a pro move. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I want to get into um, in this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And um, there's a million facets that we could cover. 
And in fact, we're going to be staying here in John chapter 6 for the next few weeks, um, talking about this story today and then the, the, the rest of the, I think it's three weeks or so we're spending in John chapter 6, looking at some of the implications of what it means for Jesus to say that he is the bread of life, that he is the bread that has come down from heaven. So there's lots to talk about and meditate on as we think through um, this very long chapter, John chapter 6, um, and what it means about who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing even now for us. And we're going to get into a lot of stuff. And I say that mostly to remind myself, dude, pace yourself. Like we've got <laughs> several weeks in John chapter 6, so I'm going to do my best not to cover everything that I want to eventually cover in one sermon. So, And speaking of that, do you think that's why nobody had a lunch when they came to see Jesus? Maybe nobody was expecting, you know, that he wouldn't be finished in time for them to go get some food. I bet you all probably never come here in the morning thinking, I bet, I bet we're not going to get out until, you know, too late to go get some food. And then about 22 minutes into my sermon, you're like, are we going to get out of here in time to go get some food? <laughs> That's one of the things that, uh, that really strikes me. But I talked to the kids about this. And, and this is one of those mornings, by the way, when like if you want like the Cliff Notes version of the sermon, what I said to the kids is the Cliff Notes version of the sermon. But, you know, it, 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 5,000, first of all, 5,000 men in the original language, 5,000 men, which means who knows how many people. They, didn't, they weren't counting the women and the children. Um, so 5,000 plus, you know, may, maybe as much as double that number, right? Could be. And no one in that entire crowd had like, I don't know, some trail mix or something? Like nobody had anything to eat? I don't know about you all, but like I can't go two hours without a snack. I mean, obviously. No one brought any food. And as I said, the, the, the author of John doesn't even tell us how many women and children were there. Uh, it's a cultural thing. You know, they counted the men, the women and children were just sort of extras. But isn't it interesting that the one person who had anything to eat, the one person who came prepared was one of these children who aren't even counted in the, uh, in the, in the total head count of the group. Nobody thought to pack a lunch except this one little boy. Well, maybe he wasn't little. We don't know how old he was, but he was a boy. Young enough that they called him boy, not a man, right? Let's think about that for a second. Let's think about how he ended up having a lunch. The first thing you have to understand, I said that the women and children weren't counted in the thing. Culturally speaking, in the ancient Near East, in the time of the Roman Empire, children were the, some of the lowest people on the societal ladder, so to speak. Um, especially children of non-Roman citizens. There is a whole social hierarchy in the Roman Empire that I'm not going to take the time to go into, but it was very stratified. There were levels, and you knew what level you were on. And children of non-Roman citizens, which we can pretty much assume this boy in the story is one of those, are way down here. Not considered to be worth much at all. They don't have anything to contribute. They use resources. Um, they, you know, get underfoot and are in the way. And so... For the story to focus on this little boy, on this one individual, is in and of itself very interesting and very telling. Because not only is there only a very little bit of food that the boy has to share, also he himself is one of the littlest, most insignificant people in the society of the time. So where'd this kid get lunch? You know, first of all, let's figure out who this kid might have been. There's a few different um, 
a few different things we can surmise that might have um, been why this boy happened to be there in the, uh, in the venue there with Jesus. Uh, one, he could have been someone's son, someone who had come to see Jesus specifically, and he was um, their son. But I don't think that's probably the case, because why did he have a lunch and the rest of the family didn't? He could have been a worker. You know, children went to work quite young. He might have been on his way to his, uh, his day job, and maybe his mom packed him up a little bit of something to eat to keep him sustained throughout his work, maybe in someone's field or vineyard or with their flock. Could be, we don't know. He might have been someone's servant, and maybe that lunch wasn't even his. Maybe he was just, you know, charged with looking after the lunch for whoever his master or employer might be. There are a few options. And what those options get us to is the reality of what a huge deal it is for this little boy to say, I've got some food. You want it, Jesus? <laughs> We tend to romanticize things and sort of like oversimplify sometimes, I think. And, and we, we sort of think of like, well, everyone that saw Jesus was just like, you know, ready to uh, give everything. And, to, and, and, you know, there's a certain extent to which we see the stories in the Bible that tell us that Jesus uh, did, as he called his followers, did, you know, have that impact. The, the disciples, you know, leave everything behind and follow him. But because we, we think about, things in those terms, we sometimes forget, and we know the end of the story too, right? We know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know that Jesus will do these amazing things, that Jesus will save the world. But imagine being one of the first followers of Jesus. Imagine being this little boy. You don't know any of that. And so it is a, a, a fantastic risk that they take when they say yes to Jesus. And this little boy certainly takes a risk. At the very least, he risks being hungry for the rest of the day. But he might also risk being uh, in a lot of trouble if he gave away food that didn't belong to him. And I'm not talking about just getting fired. He would be accused of theft. They didn't have probation back then. Could be a big deal. And so when the little boy gives this food away, he is really, in a, in a very real sense, he is giving everything. He's giving everything. Certainly giving all the food he has, right? But he may be giving up his freedom, he may be giving up his life by offering what he has to Jesus. And of course, we know how the story turns out, right? Jesus takes that little bit, turns it into um, apparently a, a restaurant that would rival um, the busiest quick serve restaurant in the history of the world, right? He just gives food out and gives food out and gives food out and gives food out. He probably could have put it in a drive through if he wanted to. If he was pull up on their donkey, you know, I'll take a fish. <laughs> It didn't take much, right? It didn't take much for Jesus to feed a multitude. A few loaves, a couple fish. It didn't take much, but it did take everything that the little boy had to give. And like I said to the children earlier, you know, it's so easy for us to dismiss ourselves, to dismiss our abilities, to dismiss our uh, contribution to dismiss whatever it is we have to offer. But over and over and over again in the scripture, we see God taking little tiny things and turning them in to big deals, to big important events in the salvation history, in God's masterful 
gracious plan to restore and renew all of creation. You know, we, we, we go back, I mean, we can go through from the beginning of the story nearly. You know, Abraham is too old to have children, and God says, I'm going to make your offspring into a nation that will save the world, right? Um, let's fast forward. Uh, Joseph, one of the youngest of Jacob's sons, uh, goes, uh, gets sold off into slavery in Egypt as a slave, the lowest low, ends up in prison at some point, and it's through him that God brings a miraculous salvation of uh food and sustenance during the midst of a very, very severe famine. Um, Ruth, who becomes an ancestor of Jesus, is a, is a foreigner, an immigrant in Israel, a widow, someone with no resources and nothing to offer, who God uses to ultimately bring about the salvation of the world because she's one of Jesus' ancestors. David is the one son of Jesse that Samuel, when he's sent to find a king, Je uh, Samuel discounts David, Jesse's son. He's like, he's the youngest. He's not, you know, he, he's, this, this isn't the guy. And God's like, no, that's the guy. Over and over and over again, the people and the things that we discount or we might discount or might not see as being much at all, are what, Jesus, what God uses to bring about God's purposes. Yeah. Over and over again, we see the littlest things making the biggest difference. And I don't want to over-romanticize it and sort of make it, this is not a you can do anything, you can be anything you want to be uh, sort of inspirational talk. That's not what I'm getting at. I don't want this to come across as just sort of a, uh, a rah-rah, you know, don't count yourself out speech. That's, that's not exactly what I'm getting at here. What I'm getting at is, <clears throat> as Paul puts it in Ephesians, how can we begin to understand the height and the depth and the breadth of God's immense love for us revealed in Jesus. Because that deep and wide love of God revealed in Jesus Christ encompasses everything, even the littlest, most insignificant things. There is nothing too small or weak. There is nothing or no one so overlooked or marginalized. There is nothing or no one so insignificant that God isn't acutely interested in whoever that is and whatever they might have to offer. I think sometimes we, we, we begin to um, get so focused on the big picture that we forget actually how big the picture is. It's sort of a forest for the trees thing, right? We, we think about the love of God, like, oh, the love of God is so wonderful. It's deep and wide. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it's broad and it's expansive and it's, and it, and it's for everyone. And, and sometimes I think that sort of like pulls us away from the reality that it is for everyone, that God's love is vast, but it is also intimate. God's love is inexhaustible, but it is also pinpointed on each and every one of us. That God has the capacity not only to love, in capital letters, the whole world, but also the ability and even the desire to focus all of his love on us. That is the depth and the breadth and the height of God's love. It's not just that it is immense and overwhelming, but all that immensity is also meant 
for each and every one of us, and indeed for each and every one of God's children, even those who we might be inclined to dismiss or discount, whether because of their living situation, their health situation, their mental health situation, their addiction situation, their financial situation. There are many things that we as human beings, even though we shouldn't, we use to, to classify and categorize each other, right? And decide what each other has to offer. People do it all the time. And yet, whatever those categorizations or classifications might be, God is ready and willing and is in fact able to use whatever anyone has to offer as part of God's incredible plan of salvation, God's plan to renew and restore all of God's creation. There's something so simple and yet so powerful about that. That the God, the God that we serve is so powerful and mighty that we can't comprehend it and also so deeply in love with each and every one of us that he wants a relationship, a personal relationship with me, with, with you, with everyone. Now that's deep and wide, right? <laughs> that's deep and wide. And yet it's also focused on each and every one of us. You know, Jesus feeds the crowd, and it's a huge miracle, right? But it's also an individual miracle. Each and every person that comes forward to receive their portion of food gets as much as they want. And the next person comes and gets as much as they want, and the next person comes and gets as much as they want, and over and over and over again. This, this incredible miracle of grace is plenty for everyone and also more than enough for each one. Isn't that something? And what does that tell us about Jesus? That Jesus doesn't discount the smallest contribution and that when we trust Jesus with what we have to give, we can expect transformation, we can expect bounty, we can expect a miracle. And notice I said, when we trust Jesus with what we have to give. This gets to the other, the other half of what I want to talk about this morning. Well, maybe the other, maybe, maybe the final third. I don't want to scare anyone that we're going to be here for another 20 minutes. The little boy doesn't do the miracle, right? He has the food, but he doesn't do the miracle. Who does the miracle? Jesus. Not a trick question. Yeah, Jesus. It is always Jesus who does the thing, whatever the thing might be. And that is so critical for us to understand because the reason why we dismiss ourselves so often and discount ourselves and what we have to give is that we decide that we are not capable of doing X, Y, Z. And that is a fundamental mistake in our Christian journey. The Christian life is not something that we do it is something that Jesus does in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is so important to understand. If it were up to each and of one of us individually to do what needs to be done to advance the kingdom of God, to grow into the image and likeness of Christ, if that was something we were responsible for accomplishing on our own, how successful do you think any one of us would be? I'm going to fess up right away and say, miserable failure. Tried it, was very bad at it, cannot 
be perfect on my own. I know that may come as a huge surprise to many of you. It certainly will surprise Kristen to, know I'm not, to, um, to hear that I'm not perfect. Actually, if you want the full report, you can talk to her. Is she back? Oh, oh, perfect timing. Perfect timing. Exhibit A. Pastor T ain't perfect. If it were up to us to perfect ourselves, we'd be in some major trouble. Amen. <laughs> but thanks be to God, that's not the ask. That's not the ask. The ask is simply to offer ourselves and what we have to God and let God do what God does. And let me tell you what God doesn't do. God doesn't destroy. God doesn't kill God doesn't demean, God doesn't uh, undermine, God doesn't put down, God doesn't dismiss, God doesn't see as insignificant, God doesn't do any of those things that we so often do for ourselves, right? Oh, I'm nothing, oh, I'm worthless, oh, I don't have anything to offer. Who all has ever had those thoughts and feelings? I bet we all have at some point. Yeah, yeah. Who's having those thoughts and feelings right now? Just me? Okay. <laughs> but what God does is God takes who we are and what we have to offer, and God uses it to feed and nourish God's people, to advance God's agenda to build God's kingdom. And it's not me who's doing the work, it's Jesus doing the work in me by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is the height and the breadth and the depth of God's immense love. Not that, you know, God loves me and now I'm supposed to go figure out a way to earn it. But that God loves me deep and wide for all that I am and even for all that I'm not. <laughs> and God sees who I am and God understands who I will be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God is working in me because of what Jesus has already accomplished at the cross. And it never takes much, but it does take everything. We give all of ourselves to God, like even the things we think are insignificant, right? But it's amazing what God can do with just a little bit, with just a little me, <laughs> with just a little old me, what God can do. And so I hope that as you leave this morning, you'll take with you the knowledge of God's enormous an expansive love for all of creation, for all of humankind, and the knowledge of God's intense desire to shower that love on each and every one of you. And that you will know that no matter what you have to offer, Jesus can and will use it. And that you remember that it's not up to you to do the work, because the work is complete. The ask is simply that we give what we have to God and let Jesus do the work through the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let Jesus do the work in us and through us. And that, by the way, is where peace and joy and freedom come from from knowing that it's Jesus, not me, who is doing everything, who has done everything to save me, to make me holy, and to use me to build the kingdom of God. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, 
you know what I'm going to say is good news. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.